Hello there. Welcome to the latest in our quality online course series, Promoting Learning with Technology. Today you have two presenters. My name is Stephanie Richter. I'm the Assistant Director of the Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center at Northern Illinois University. And I'm joined by my colleague, Tracy Miller, who is the Online Teaching Coordinator. We'll trade off a little bit throughout the program today. Because we are focusing on technology, we've thrown a few more pieces of technology into the mix today. So we do want to welcome you. If you do tweet, if you want to tweet about today, use the hashtag QOC Tech for Quality Online Course Technology. That's our uh, selected hashtag for today, at least. I don't know if anyone plans to use it, but just know that that's available for you. We'll keep our eye on it and address any questions that come in through it during the session. So by the end of today, of today's session, we hope that you will be able to select tech the which start that over again. We hope that you'll be able to select technology that aligns with and supports your learning objectives, that you'll be able to promote active learning amongst your students with that technology, because of that technology, and that you'll be able to look at the technology you've chosen or are considering to verify that it's obtainable, current, and suitable for use in your class. To begin with, let's go over some of the technology considerations that we'd like you to keep in mind when you're choosing technology for an online course. Then in the second part of the workshop, we'll go through different ways of using technology and offer some suggestions for what technology you might be using or might want to use. So first, I want your input, though. What do you consider? What do you think about when you're choosing a new technology? Because we're, we're going high tech today, you've got three choices. You can tweet that to hashtag QOC tech. You can post your suggestion in the text chat, or if you raise your hand, I'll uh, cede the floor and you can use your microphone. But just give us a few comments, if you would, on what you think about when you're choosing a new technology. Ah, yes, credibility of the source. That's a great suggestion. Um, definitely thinking about where it's coming from. That ties, I think, into a lot of different avenues, uh, whether the Technology will be available for a while. You don't want something that's coming in now that won't be available in a year, as well as uh, whether or not it's accurate. If this is a technology like a, uh, an online resource or textbook, absolutely credibility is an important thing to consider when you're considering whether the uh, content is accurate. Great. Well, keep your suggestions coming. Anything that you tend to think about when you're choosing a new technology, and we'll discuss those more as we go. The first thing that we would like you to consider when you're choosing a technology for, to be honest, a face-to-face -face or an online course, in either case, think about how that technology supports your learning objectives. The, the purpose of technology, the goal of technology, should always be to further your students' learning in some way. That doesn't necessarily have to be content learning. That could mean furthering their ability to collaborate. It could mean increasing your efficiency so that you can spend more time on your, your students and their learning. But be sure that there's always some connection to the teaching or learning going on in the course. Otherwise, it's it's often very easy to find really cool tools out there and then pick them because they're cool and exciting and not necessarily because they tie specifically to the learning objectives or, or to the purpose of the course. Uh, and that's the, the first, I think, way that we, we run into problems with technology is picking too many tools because they're cool and not because they actually solve a problem. The second factor to consider is usability of the technology. And we'll actually have a separate uh, workshop like this one talking about usability of your, your course, too, of your, for our cases here at NIU, that would be your Blackboard course. Because usability is usually a term that's used for web design. In this case, with technology in general, when we refer to usability, 
what we're really talking about is whether or not students are going to be able to use that technology. There's certainly an element of accessibility to this to consider whether or not the technology that you're selecting is accessible to students with disabilities of multiple sorts. But most importantly, will students be able to learn and use that technology? And what type of support will they need from you in order to do that? For many tools like Blackboard and the tools embedded within Blackboard, NIU has uh, help documentation and a technology support desk that will help students use those. But for many web-based tools, that's going to fall on you uh, in order to provide that training if necessary, as well as follow-up support if there are issues. So the usability of the technology in terms of how students can learn it and use it is always critical. The other flip side, though, is while we talk a lot about choosing technologies that are easy to learn or easy to use, you don't have to limit yourself just to easy to use tools. Because quite often there are tools that students really do need to have skills with. So for example, I think of in engineering, CAD is a fairly complex system that's not an easy one to learn <laughs> to use or to actually use. However, when you go back to consideration one with supporting the learning objectives, being able to use that software and work in that environment is critical for those students' education so that when they leave the university, they have those skills. Uh, I also think about uh, systems like web conferencing. They're generally fairly easy to use, but there's definitely a learning curve to adapting to them. However, in our increasingly digital world, it's important for students to have those skills as well. So those are the, the two primary considerations is one, when possible, choose technologies that are easy for students to learn and to use. But when in doubt, if it's a technology that's really essential, that there's value in students learning to use it, then by all means, use it even if it might be a little bit more complex. But think about those support issues very early on. The third factor that we recommend is obtainability, which kind of is a very broad umbrella. It covers a lot of different things. One of them is simply, can students get the technology? Can they access it through the web? Um, if, it's, if you want them to use Google Docs, for example, are students able to get to it? Or if it's something that they need to install, how do they go about getting it, downloading it, installing it? Um, and is that available for both Mac and PC computers? We actually recently had a concern um, about Google Chromebooks. Chromebooks are very inexpensive, and they're very powerful for what they are. But if for students who might be considering using a Chromebook for an online course, they'll need to know very early on that if any software needs to be installed, because a Chromebook, you can't install software on. So for example, if you need students to be able to install uh, a particular operating or a particular word processing system, if, you, if they have to use uh, Microsoft Word, for example, they won't be able to install that on their Chromebook. So you'll need to find alternative uh, backups for those too, like now uh, having access to Office 365 online means they can use the software that way too. But there's a, a broad scope of questions here in terms of can they access it online, can they install it, and what systems can they install that on? A lot of that is uh, to be included, honestly, in upfront expectations for students as to what technology is appropriate for them to use as an online student. And we'll talk about that in a minute. The second thing that I like to include as part of obtainability is expense. Uh, most of the software that I recommend, at least in my online courses, is free, which is the perfect expense for most students. Uh, but again, depending on the, the field, you may need to have students purchase something that's a fairly expensive piece of software. So that's a, a consideration for you to think about based on if they need it only for your course, if they'll use it for multiple courses, and if there's an alternative way 
for students to be able to access that. If you aren't familiar, um, your department can actually partner with the Division of IT now in order to enable online web-based access to software that students might need. For example, um, IT has created a, a web version, well, basically installed a, a version of SPSS, the statistical software, that all NIU students, faculty, and staff can access via the web. So if you're teaching SPSS in a course, students don't need to actually purchase the software. They can log in and access it online. And your department can partner with IT if there is software like that you'd like them to be able to look into. And then you can, your department may need to pay for a license for it, but they can make that web available at least. So students won't need to purchase a, a version of it themselves. Yes, Alicia, SPSS, that's probably a fairly new, maybe in the last six to eight months that that's been widely available. But it's, it's immensely powerful to be able to do that, to know that students have access to that, particularly graduate students working on uh, research projects. They don't need to buy a version of their own anymore. Uh, you know what, Alicia, I don't have the link offhand, but once I turn over to Tracy, I will go find the link for um, the Anywhere apps, is what it's called, through IT, and I'll post it here in the text chat once I get a chance to do so. It's very, very cool to be able to have that access. The other, the fourth primary technology concern that uh, you should consider is accessibility. Whether or not the, the technology you want students to use is actually accessible for students with disability. That's a, um, a big, heavy concern to think about. Uh, most of our standard software that we use is accessible. But if you choose to use something that um, is outside of the, the Blackboard and Microsoft ecosystem, I would make sure to check the, the website of the system and maybe even write to them to verify that the technology really is accessible. Uh, that's a, a very, very big concern if you have a student who does have a disability and there's an aspect of the course that they're unable to, to use. A few other factors. These are important, but, but maybe secondary. I wouldn't call them critical. The first one is mobile. More and more, <laughs> we're getting by and, and relying on our mobile devices. I actually have my, my phone and my tablet. That's how I'm watching the, the hashtag to make sure nothing comes in on the Twitter feed that I need to pay attention to. So when you're choosing tools, if you can choose tools that are mobile accessible, that's sort of an added value to students to be able to participate from a mobile device. I try to make my online courses as mobile accessible as possible so that students, I wouldn't recommend that an online student only take a course from a mobile device at this point although it's certainly done. Um, but I try to enable that whenever possible so that they can access it that way. And then the second consideration for me is student data. And I think this is something we're becoming more and more aware of uh, as, as we continue to foray into web-based learning, social media, um, and all of the intricacies wrapped around that. And that is when when you sign up for various services online, you're essentially giving away personal data, whether that is something, someone like Facebook, where they get a lot of your personal data, or Google, uh, anything, any service you sign up for, suddenly owns a little bit of your data. So when you're using tools outside of our NIU ecosystem, I recommend that you at least think about what data the students are going to be giving up about themselves in that environment and what the privacy policy is for how that technology, how that data is used, the data are used. Um, so that might mean if you want to use social media, if you're going to require that students use social media in your course, make them aware of Twitter's privacy policy. You can, honestly, it might be enough to just post a link in the course to make it easy for students to see and be aware of it. Uh, so that they know how their personal data is being used as a result. And then my, my final general suggestion about technology that you're requiring for your course 
is that somewhere you clearly specify what technology is required, what technology is optional. Um, for example, hardware would be the first thing I would consider. If your course requires a webcam and headphones, for example, in order to participate in online synchronous sessions, make sure that's clear. And make sure that if there are specific specifications, anything, any requirements about how good those are or what they can and can't do, make sure that's specified as well. Uh, if you have any software that you require, if they need to be, have access to Microsoft Office, uh, if they need to have Adobe Acrobat Reader installed or uh, Flash or Java, uh, it's important to be able to let students know about those specific requirements. I will say to help you that uh, eLearning Services has put together a list of generally what's um, what the minimum requirements would be for an online student, and we'll find that link for you as well to, to share with you. That's a great way to get some of that out of the way so that you don't need to specify all of those little pieces. Uh, you don't need to tell students that they should have Adobe Reader. Uh, if you can share this technology requirements from the university that says all online students should have Adobe Reader installed, and here's how to get it. Uh, so we've tried to they've tried to, e-learning has tried to take some of that overhead off of you, which means, however, though, still, you need to think about what tools you're using that are special to your course and how to specify that to your students and how to help them get it. That doesn't mean help as in subsidize, but if they need a headset, maybe give them a link to a sample one on Amazon. That would be a, a great suggestion. Or let them know where you've seen them at Amazon or Best Buy or Walmart, um, just to help them find the technology that they need if they might not have it. Any feedback or questions about things to consider when you're choosing technology or the requirements that you might have for your course? I see a few of you type in question, type in comments at least. Good, Alicia, I'm glad everything's clear. Um, I'll give just a second and wait for a few others. Well, thank you, Melissa. I'm glad you appreciated all of the, the suggestions. Um, Isabel, sometimes the usual upgrades, I'm assuming you're mean to Blackboard create some difficulties with the, the systems. Blackboard and others, Blackboard's not the only one, but probably the one that has the greatest impact. And yes, I, I understand anytime something upgrades or changes that invariably causes some issues, um, we try to anticipate those as much as we can. For other technologies out there, of course, that you'll have to try to anticipate those as well. And help students navigate through dealing with those two, because I think that's an important skill, particularly for an online student to develop on their own, is what are the, what are the technology skills they need to survive in our, and thrive, not just survive, in our increasingly digital world. With that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Tracy, who will start sharing with you some tips for using technology to connect with your students and what types of tools you might select. All right, hello everyone. A uh, quick check mark that my microphone is actually working. So if you can hear me okay, give me a check mark. I see some coming in. Perfect. Okay, so let's talk about how we can use technology to connect with our students in some different ways. Um, so I'd like to throw a question out there. Um, do you make an announcement um, in your face-to-face -face course or in your online course each week? And again, you can use our hashtag QOC tech or put something in the checkbox. Yes, of course. OK, so you're already using um, technology if you're using it in your online course to make an announcement. And so you know, we just want to make sure that you, know, you think about that, that that's a way that you can connect with your students. 
So some of our recommend, recommendations are um, that if you are going to communicate, communicate early. So one of our recommendations is actually that communicate early can actually mean you can create an announcement um, or maybe even send out an email. Uh, the week before class starts, just to kind of welcome everyone to the class and um, make them feel sort of prepared and not overly anxious uh, when things are getting started. Um, the second recommendation is to communicate um, frequently. And I'm going to give you some tips on how you can communicate frequently with your um, students. Um, but that just, again, um, gives you uh, an avenue um, to keep in touch with your students and help um, kind of mitigate that feeling of isolation that online students may have. And then to, to even go even further with that, to respond quickly to your students um, so that uh, they don't go, um, go too long feeling disconnected. And, and to just think about that as you're going through your online um, teaching um, early, often, and quickly is the thing to keep in the back of your mind. Um, so here's some of my suggestions for how to make that happen. Uh, first of all, uh, create a plan for how you are going to kind of implement these connective policies in your course. Um, plan out your weekly announcements. In the example I have up above here, uh, this is a welcome to unit eight. And so the idea is that this instructor, which by the way is Jason Rohde's uh, course, he allowed us to borrow some of his um, information that he uses in his course. He has created a weekly announcement um, for his students. So it, he knows that at least once a week, so frequently, at least once a week, he has this announcement um, welcoming his students to the content, welcome them to kind of what's going to unfold over the course of the week. So the idea that you have this plan made out um, can really help you ensure that you're going to have that frequency. Um, and you can use the technology you built in the Blackboard um, and use the time and date um, features that allow those messages to just sort of appear in, in a timely way, um, saving you some time um, when the actual week is opening up and, and you're kind of immersed in the course at that time. Um, but that not only allows you, this plan allows you to have everything kind of um, outlined and ready to go, but it frees you up to even have more connections with your students. Because then if something just pops up that you weren't expecting, a current event or you know an article that you just read, you can create an additional announcement that week and you're communicating and connecting with your students even more frequently um, because you've made this plan ahead of time. Um, the other recommendation is that if you select a technology you'd prefer for communication, tell your students what that is. So if you know that your um, communication style is really going to be these um, frequent announcements um, and that you will be communicating with your students through that way, if they have any questions, they are to email you. You know, you're being really specific in letting your students know how you would like to be um, communicated with. Um, if you plan on hosting um, live office hours and that's your kind of um, preference, then again, let your students know that they should come to your office hours. Um, you know, discussion boards, whatever it is, um, take your preferred technology and, and share that plan with your students and uh, that should really help out. The next idea is that in order to connect with your students through technology, um, you might need to think about having a strong online presence. And so these are just some questions, again, some ideas in the back of your head that you might think about in order to really foster this idea of a strong online presence. Um, so do you plan on being friendly and approachable. I certainly hope you do. Uh, but, you know, think of what that means uh, for your students. You know, uh, you, you definitely don't have to be overly friendly. You know, you definitely have an authoritative role in a course. And so, sense, Isabel, sensitive, absolutely. You know, you want to make them feel like um, 
you're here for them and um, you know you're you're part of their learning process. Um, and so it's important to think about what your, again, your online presence is sort of going to be like. So this next one, do you wear a suit? And you're thinking, okay, Tracy, you're absolutely crazy because why would I care about wearing a suit when I was teaching an online course? And what I always think about kind of from this perspective is, you know, when I put a suit on or um, I put something more formal on, I sort of feel like more professional. And so maybe you're not literally putting on a suit, um, you know, online courses. You can still be sitting at home and, and in your jammies or whatever. But just, you know, how professional are you going to be in this atmosphere? Um, what sort of um, demeanor do you want to have when you're connecting with your students? And then, of course, if you are having um, recordings or um, sessions like we're having today, um, do you want to wear a suit? Or are you more of a, um, a, a casual person? Um, uh, we always talk to the teaching assistants about this. Um, you know, maybe the polo shirt is the more professional um, attire for it. So you still need to kind of think about your online presence um, from that perspective. Another thing we talk to the teaching assistants about, um, and I think we're all very familiar with as experienced um, teaching staff and faculty, is what do they call you? And so, you know, that's something that you uh, reinforce in the way maybe you're signing the announcements. And sometimes you feel like you don't really need to sign an announcement. Um, but maybe you do, because that's letting your students know um, who you are in this environment and how they should address you. So I think it's still something to, to think about even if you're not seeing them face to face on a regular basis. Um, do you share some personal information? And I put the word some in there um, because you know we all don't want to put in too much personal information but in order to have that feeling of connection you know through the technology world uh, can you um, share some personal information and I think we we, we do share some personal information um, we'll also often talk about um, where we live maybe a couple hobbies um, our, our family structure, um, something like that. And so, you know, to keep that connection with your students, even in an online um, environment, um, think about what you might be able to share with them um, as regards to personal information. Um, we're going to talk about social media in a little bit, um, but another thing to think about is this idea of should they follow you on Twitter? Do you have um, a professional persona that, again, connects to that online presence um, that you would recommend to your students that they follow you through social media in some way? So again, just some questions to think about as you're building your strong online presence. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can use technology um, for creating this strong online presence. And the first one is to um, think about creating an about me space. And that can be uh, definitely in your Blackboard course. Um, and again, you're, now you're wrapping up all these answers to the questions we just talked about. Are you going to share a little bit about what you do uh, professionally outside of um, maybe a specific Blackboard course? Are you going to share a little bit about your family? Um, are you going to, in this case, Jason's added a picture of himself? Um, you know, are you going to add a picture of your family? You know, all these things that we just sort of talked about. Um, you can now add to your About Me space, or you can actually add them throughout the course. So my next tip is using video or pictures. Uh, Blackboard has this tool called uh, Video Everywhere, and you'll find it all over the place. Um, it actually looks like a little web camera. So if you open up a uh, text editor or even the opening to a discussion forum and you see the little um, icon that looks like a web camera, uh, that means that you can actually create a little uh, video of yourself and again creating that presence, creating that online um, 
that online presence, um, but also that connection uh, with your students. Another tip, um, if you do author a blog or you have some blog that you would like to link within your course, and again, just sort of sharing a little bit more outside of maybe what the curriculum is in the course, um, add a link to your blog space. Allow students to connect with you and um, with your professional world a little bit more by adding a blog space. Um, changing gears a little bit, um, be a husky. And what I mean by that is, you know, that's a great way that um, online students can connect with maybe some campus activity. Now maybe they can't come to a basketball game, um, but just like throwing it out there that you're husky and you're husky fan too and, and last night's score was blah, blah, blah and, and we won, yay, go huskies. And, and again, just kind of bringing um, those online students um, into our world here and um, it makes us seem more relatable. Um, and this, this last one kind of ties back to what I said before with your communication strategy. Um, what is your email strategy? You know, just make sure you uh, establish one and follow through with it. So how would you like the students to address you? Um, how frequently or how quickly will you respond back to an email? Um, are students encouraged to email each other? You know, just thinking about that will, will help um, using that, that tried and true technology now emails. Okay, so a question that I'm going to throw out to the group again, and again, you have a couple options. Um, you can tweet your answers, you can post them in the text chat, um, or raise your hand. But how do your students connect with each other now? So I just want you to think about that in the back of your head a little bit, maybe tweet out. In case you hadn't figured it out, we'll see if we get some text chats in here. Um, Isabel's asking for the class. How do the students connect with each other? Yes, absolutely for the class. And I'll let you think about that a little bit. But what I'm suggesting, discussion boards, absolutely. But students are already connecting with each other. Um, through different social medias, and they are communicating with each other um, using technology, um, but possibly outside the, the class environment. And so what we're suggesting here is that, you know, in order to connect with students, um, sometimes we need to connect with them where they're already living. And this is actually part of an old infographic, just a couple years old, but I'm sure we think that the trends are still in the, leading in the same way that more and more students are connecting with each other through social media. Some great suggestions, Lisha. So I wanted to give you some tips for using social media. Um, and just um, if you're not comfortable with them yet, this is just some sort of things that you might want to try. Um, and, and maybe you're way ahead of me on these two, for sure. Um, creating a course Facebook page. And um, you know, it's, it's a page. The students can like it. They can follow it. Um, you can put up different resources. They can put up different resources. Um, they can connect with each other. Um, Alicia's got a, a Twitter and a hashtag handle. She's a, the perfect segue for my next um, point. You know, if you don't want to get involved with um, managing a Facebook page, you know, maybe you're just going to use a hashtag um, for a weekly topic. Uh, we used a hashtag for today's session. Um, just to kind of show you how easy it is. Students are, um, can be connected with each other through Twitter already. Uh, and now they can just kind of add a hashtag if, um, if something pops up and, and they're interested in um, sharing it with the other students um, in the course and you know, the other people that they follow um, on Twitter. 
uh, the next two have a different kind of feel to them. Um, allow students to explore social media. And what I mean by that is, you know what, they're going to be doing it anyways. And so kind of give them permission to um, perhaps um, find different resources through social media. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to allow them to um, cite it in a written paper or it's going to be part of a final presentation. But ju you know, just kind of realize that they're going to be doing it. And so um, might as well take advantage of it. They may find a really good resource. They might also find a real stinker. And you know, just allow them to kind of talk about it and say, you know, I read this thing the other day. Um, and you know, I know because of the content that we discussed in the research that we've looked at um, that it's really um, not a reliable resource. And that kind of gets to what I'm saying about allow the students to share. If they find something, um, maybe they're um, following a, an expert or an authority on something um, on Twitter and they come across it on their Twitter feed, uh, there's no reason that they can't um, share this and, and cite it like they would normally. Um, but just knowing that they're evaluating that resource and being kind of critical uh, about how they're using it. Um, Isabel said, can these external media be connected to Blackboard and have a record of the interactions? Um, and Stephanie's actually answering you, so yay team, because I want to get to the next slide because we're moving through these really quickly. Um, a couple of ideas um, outside of Blackboard and um, outside of things maybe that you've thought about before, a couple just um, ones that we like and recommend. Um, connect with your students. Use this um, remind tool. And it's a way that you can send text messages to your students, um, but not th necessarily through your own phone. They're not going to necessarily have your personal um, phone number. And so it's kind of a way to still communicate with your students, but separate yourselves a little bit. And then a couple other um, tools that we've come across that students use to connect with each other um, for live um, interaction and text chats and things like that it's using Skype or Google Hangouts. And um, it, you know, it's up to you um, if you want them to report back. For instance, you know, um, if you have a group project and you want them to get back to you later and say, um, give me a synopsis of what you talked about. Um, at, at your live chat. That's something that might be useful for your students. So I'm going to quickly give it back. And um, Stephanie's going to talk about engaging students in learning. Sure. Excuse me a moment. Everything has, sorry, everything froze for me a little bit. So I'm going to. Um, Hopefully, everything's back now. Excellent. Engaging students in learning with technology. So I presented this actually in the last session in this series where we talked about active learning um, strategies in general. There are really three different types of interaction that students have, or three different places. They have interaction between you and the students, interaction between students and content, and students interacting with each other. So when I say building multiple opportunities for interaction, today I'm going to focus first on these sorts of social interactions, how students interact with you and with each other. And the more opportunities that you can provide for students to do that, the more that they'll feel actually connected as a course and connected to you, which are, in the grand scheme, all part of student retention and student success. So one of the tools that I think we go to first in our heads for interaction, for getting students to talk to each other and talk to you, are discussion boards. Um, it's a great way to have students uh, share what they've learned and share what they're thinking about when it comes to the technology. A few recommendations I have for discussion boards, actually, is to focus on questions that, are, um, that aren't that are specifically answerable. So again, this comes from 
Jason's course. I particularly like question option four here, for example. Um, there, this is an instructional design course where students are, see, are right now thinking about imagining that they, they have a client that they're working with who asks how to suggest uh, multiple evaluations throughout the process and wants to know what your response is. I think one of the things I like about this is that it's a, a big question. It's a case study almost where students are giving their input on how they would respond. It's not a question that they can go back to the textbook and find an answer on. And it's something that hopefully every student would answer slightly differently. So there's, there's more plurality of opinions. There's more variety of opinions. The other thing I think you I'd like to point out to note here about the use of the technology is that students have options for what question to answer. So they're given a little bit more um, freedom in how they approach it. A few other things to consider with discussion boards that I haven't posted here uh, that isn't part of this example is you can um, have students post media to discussion boards. So to sort of advance the technology consideration even further, a discussion board traditionally is text, but now through either the Video Everywhere or Helix Media integrations with Blackboard, students can take videos of themselves responding to a discussion board or take videos, take photos of uh, things out in the world and post that to the discussion board to share and start, to either start or continue a conversation that's already occurring. So when you take a tool like the discussion board uh, that we, we feel like we know it's pretty mundane, there are still plenty of ways to continue to grow that so that it, it becomes more engaging and more powerful through the use of additional technology. For engaging students with content and really encouraging them to think about the content in new ways. Uh, there are so many great content tools out there that I don't want to dwell on them too much, but things like uh, incorporating videos from YouTube, incorporating open education resources, OER, there's a whole world of those out there cataloged and, and reviewed, ready for you to discover. Um, of course, your publisher creates a lot of technology-based resources you can use in an online course, like um, online textbooks and review materials, little study games, and um, quizzes to test their knowledge. Lots of great resources out there. But one thing that I always feel is an important part of having students engage with content in particular is reflection. So. That can be done easily in Blackboard or outside of Blackboard by using a blog, whether you use it as a public blog within the course in Blackboard where students can read each other's posts, or if you use it more privately like a journal where it's for students to reflect personally and share those reflections with you. The, the nature of a blog is really designed for quick and informal uh, text-based or media-based responses, and I think decreases the overhead of formality to really ask students to think critically instead of focusing on um, academic language and protocols. That doesn't mean, that means, of course, that this is not the solution for all types of writing, but a blog or journal through Blackboard, through uh, WordPress, Blogger or um, website tools like Google Sites and Weebly. I'm going to check that one in the text chat if you haven't heard of it. It's Weebly, W E E B L Y. It's kind of a strange word. But it's another tool where students can easily make their own websites to both reflect on, to show them reflecting on their thinking as well as. Uh, convey that to the world so it becomes a little bit more public. Alicia Earfman Wix, W-I-X. I haven't used that one, but free is always good, something more to look into, into how those tools can 
work for you and can supplement your learning objectives. The other tool that I really like for helping students interact with content in particular is using frequent low stakes or non-graded assessments in your course. Particularly for online courses, I think students don't get that, that time to practice. And you can build that in in a number of ways. One way is certainly to incorporate actual quizzes in your course. Uh, students can take a quiz, whether it's worth just a few points or worth zero points just for self-assessment purposes. They can practice that themselves, learn more about their own learning. And the beauty of most of the question types that you can use on a test or a quiz is that they're also automatically graded. So then you can take off some time from grading and students can get instantaneous feedback. One other suggestion, though, is if you're using a presentation software like um, Adobe Presenter, Articulate, Camtasia, or Adobe Captivate, these tools all have ways that you can embed questions directly into the presentation. So if you've recorded a presentation overall on a particular topic, you can actually pause every few slides or every few minutes to have students answer a question. These are done independently. Each student does it on their own. But they can use that as a, a self-reflection to determine whether or not they really know the content. Studies have actually shown that taking these frequent breaks, frequent pauses to reflect, think, and respond to questions increases students' comprehension dramatically over watching a, a straight lecture. See, I've seen recommendations everywhere from interspersing these every five to seven minutes to one study that started with a nine minute video and added these types of interactions up to 30 times in nine minutes. And they found with every increase in uh, the number of times they stopped, students learned more. Uh, they eventually got frustrated. 30 times in nine minutes is very, very short little video segments to watch before you have to answer a question. So the, the frustration factor might be too much for students. But they still learned more at that many times than they did at, at 21 than they did at 14. So that's something to keep in mind if you're building these sorts of narrated lectures to go into your course. And then this is more of a consideration than it is a specific technology, but it's, it's mostly a tip, I guess. And that is to look at technology that fosters engagement rather than hindering it. Too often technology gets really heavy. And it's a struggle to work with a technology, let alone learn from the technology. So I have here, let me grab, I have the link as well. I'll put into the text chat. This is just a, an example of a technology called Answer Garden. Answer Garden lets you pick a, type out a question, and then students respond to build a word cloud of responses. So if you want to take a second and click that link in the text chat, you can go and add your own responses to this particular question on what technology can you not live without. And you can see those, that answer garden, that word cloud change as you enter your responses. This particular technology is very focused. It does one thing, but it does it really, really well. That's one of the, that's what I like about this the most. It's not going to solve other problems, but it's one technology that does one thing and it does it in a way that really, that's really easy. So it fosters that engagement rather than getting in the way in really any way. It's just too easy to use otherwise. Keep your eye out for technologies like that. When you find them, use them. Uh, it won't fix your course. It won't make your course perfect but it should help as you go. Pull everywhere, as Alicia mentions, is another great example. So now, again, Tracy's going to talk All right. about All right. I know everybody's still playing with the answer garden, but I'll try to share a little bit about um, uh, some tips for using technologies with assessments. And the first one is to use technology to enable multiple forms of assessment. And I've 
put this quick graphic together. Um, we're all familiar with these terms. Um, you know, assessments can be formative or summative, informal or formal, individual or groups. And so I've just given us all some ideas away about we have so many of these tools already available um, to us through Blackboard that it should be fairly easy for us to be able to use multiple forms of assessment and kind of hit in, in these areas in multiple ways. Um, you know, Blackboard quizzes, it, it's actually called Blackboard tests. So whether it's a quiz, a test, or exam, it's the same tool. Um, it's just kind of the intention is a little bit different. Um, you know, you can use blogs informally, and you can use assignments formally. You can kind of see the, the way this, um, the technology is what actually allows us um, to really um, give our students assessments in multiple different ways. Um, we want to be able to provide our students with opportunities to track their progress. This is another one of our recommendations. And um, through Blackboard, you know, we didn't go too much outside of Blackboard when we were thinking about assessments. And that's because um, it really had what we needed here. And so students can track their progress um, by using the My Grades feature in Blackboard. And so I think we're fairly familiar with that looking at our attendance today. And so, you know, definitely can you look at it on their PCs um, or any of their um, Macs, but they can also look at their grades in multiple uh, in mobile devices. And um, that's what students really love about it. It's quick and easy. Anytime they, they want to be able to check their grades, um, they can check them on their mobile devices. And so I just want to um, put that in our heads in, in case we've forgotten that students are able to track their progress that way. Um, but they're not just looking at their grades. They want to be able to look at um, feedback that we give them. And technology helps us um, in some great ways in Blackboard specifically. And one is providing students feedback through our interactive rubrics. And the great thing about the Blackboard interactive rubrics is, yeah, they take some work to set them up. Um, but then they make grading really easy for us. Um, and it really um, provides the student with some feedback because we've already set up the expectations. And if they take a moment and look at um, how we've um, provided feedback in the way that we've really defined the rubric and we've graded them based on um, what our expectations were and how they fell into that, um, they're going to click on that grade. They're going to um, wonder what kind of additional feedback um, how they fell short or um, how they could make improvements um, might be clearly outlined already in a rubric. Um, the other one I wanted to mention was the Blackboard inline grading and how you can annotate it. And if you're not using this tool already for written work, um, we found that when it was introduced um, almost two years ago that um, folks were really excited about it. And so uh, this tool, can allow you to just mark up those papers um, and give students that feedback. And um, you can tell, um, you can give them comments. You can highlight different items that you wanted to point out. And then you can definitely give them just some, some general feedback on their paper. And, and they can look at them on their computer. They can look at them on their mobile devices um, and be able to, to improve their work and um, realize what they need to do for the, the next iteration. So we always like to wrap up our series now that we've been doing for several weeks um, with how this connects to Quality Matters. Um, in case you are new to the process, Quality Matters is the new quality online standards that NIU has adopted. And so today we've been talking about uh, general standard number six, which is uh, course technologies. And so what the Quality Matters rubric is saying is that quality online courses use current and readily obtainable technologies which support learning objectives, 
by promoting active and alert, engaged learning. And we couldn't figure out how to fit this one, last one into a sentence, but um, it's, a, it's important nevertheless that you should provide privacy policy links within the courses so the students understand how their um, data is being used. So that is actually um, our big long sentence and little add-on uh, for meeting the quality matters standards in your online courses. In summary, um, what we've talked about today is that technology should support your learning objectives. Um, technology should support opportunities for active learning and interaction, and that foster, technology should foster and not hinder communication, engagement, and assessment strategies. If you do have any questions, type them into the text chat um, or maybe even tweet out. But we wanted to introduce you again to ourselves. If you have any questions, um, follow us on Twitter. We have our handles um, under our pictures here. And then we've also started the uh, online program development and support uh, Facebook page and Twitter. Um, so follow us or like us through those mediums. Um, and we will be definitely continuing to add resources for you um, through those mediums. So other than that, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Um, I hope to see you next time. And again, we'll hang out for a few minutes in case you have any questions.